so yeah, so from those two very different perspectives, I mean, I still like to frame it in the term maker architects. I mean, I still think um, there's this sense of uh, how both of you take the architect's eye and apply it to, to sort of extend your authorship. I mean, in Tom's case, I think, you know, it's through, through, the, through, through making, but also through designing and essentially, you know, designing, I mean, y we're seeing some of the projects in the background here, but essentially you're designing everything. So, so you create a complete piece of architecture, which is, um, which is maybe more of some, which, is, which sort of was the original power of the architect, the mid-century, mid-20th century architect had the power to design completely mm -hmm. and, and to think completely and to think about uh, the bigger ideas of, of the social ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from Anthony's perspective, there's again the sense of the maker, because again, you're also trying to make complete pieces of architecture, you know, through designing and working with communities and even getting down to the detail. It's in about the small detail, the fireplaces, you know, there's a sense of detail, a sense of materiality, which is very, very tactile, but is also, again, about the detail, about the architect's eye delivering that detail, but in a very different way, in a completely mm -hmm. different way. And I think, you know, there's, there's nice, talk about the agency of the architect and devolving the agency of the architect and sharing that. So, um, so for, for me, both of you are still maker architects from, from different, it's a completely different perspective. And maybe the end products are still what I would call complete pieces of architecture. So I guess, um, I don't know who wants to go first, but would, would you agree with that? Would you say you, that is the aim of a maker architect is to make it complete? and to feel it is complete. Go ahead. Well, thanks. Well, I guess firstly, we're legally not architects yet, um, which is quite useful. I think, I think, um, I don't know, I think- So, like you're, so, you, so you're the, you have freedom. I think it's a freedom. you can take more risk. I think it's both. I think yeah. like, I think the title can be, I think like also what Tom talked about, so like it's not necessarily about like whether or not it's complete or not. It's about the fact you're you're aware that you're sharing a process with like a vast number of other people, and I think that that makes a huge difference whether it's you know in what way you do that. But it's the acknowledgement that you the thing that you're making is not this kind of um, individual product that you've kind of conceived of and you've driven through. And again, like the kind of complete antithesis to that Randian model of the fountainhead, you know, Howard Rule, mm -hmm. kind of building his building. If he doesn't like it, he blows it up. And like actually, the, you know, I thought the, the allegory of it being a allegory, analogy of it being a kind of composer is really nice because it's like the idea that yeah, it, in whatever way, you're, you're the, the end product is the result of vastly more hands than than the individual. And I think a lot of the narrative about architecture, especially in the sort of modernist and sort of twentieth century, and, and in some ways the kind of um, star architect type thing, is about this kind of single hand that kind of really does everything. And it feels actually that. Even historically, that's not really the case. I don't think actually what we're talking about is anything new. You know, you talk about like people like William Morris and Upton Craft movement and all those in the Bauhaus and, and what we like Hans Meyer were doing there. That this, these aren't new ideas, and it's just the acknowledgement that the building is a far more complicated total piece than mm -hmm. one person has any authorship over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree. And you know, it's it's uh, it's frustrating. Uh, the architect um, issue is actually kind of interesting and. Um, we could talk a little bit further about that, but I think it's it's so uh, it, it's so misdirected in so many ways because it really implies, as Anthony says, that there was one person that was the author of this whole thing. And if you're really smart as a as an architect, you're actually engaging your client quite carefully and intimately in a way to sort of extract from them what what they're thinking and how they're thinking. Because man. I can't imagine anything more boring than doing your own thing every single time without having that sort of influence. And you hear these sort of awful stories about um, it's my way or the highway, and um, I call it skiing the trees. You know, I grew up skiing, so for me, you know, to ski a big bowl and just do a big bunch of linked uh, uh, turns is actually kind of boring. But to ski through trees you're actually doing something quite fun because it's like playing jazz or something. You're in communication. You're kind of in dialogue with the trees and with the, with the snow and the situation. And you're using, again, you're using this, these tools to sort of make your way through the, uh, through the trees. And those, man, those trees are, you know, everything from bureaucracies to uh, communities to uh, cultures to 
um, te technical issues. I mean, we're limited. Budget issues. I mean, we are obviously strictly limited on some of these projects with budgets. Others have higher budgets. Higher budgets don't necessarily mean indulgences because higher budgets come with other things that you have to sort of take care of. So it's always about, I think it's always about discipline and understanding how to, how to ski the trees, mm. how you engage it. I mean, I'm, but I'm, so I'm, so I'm sort of hearing that there's this sense of, um, of, you know, both of you are trying to sort of reassemble things, aren't you? I mean, it's, y as, you, as Anthony said, it's like, um, it's, a, it's a way of making, but making things happen. And it seems to be there's this, there's this ability to sort of reassemble. I mean, there's the history of that. I mean, it, as you were saying, it could go back to 100 years ago with William Morris and then this, this uh, rise of technology and engaging with manufacturing. And again, that, that kind of happened again sort of 50 years later. But I think the last 50 years, I mean, we can't kind of, you know, the rise of the star, star architect has kind of come around because architects traditionally, have, the general architect has lost power. You know, the general architect is kind of challenged by other disciplines. So the star architect has kind of, in a way, replaced that and, yeah. and actually become the kind of centre of attention. It but I think you, as maker architects, you're very different. I mean, I think you, you're totally. skilled. You, you've got different skills, and I think the products you make are different as well. I don't think I don't see your your uh, your output as arch uh, <coughs> your architecture output as the same as star architecture or the same as a general I'm architect. I'm glad I think you you're working in a different way. Yeah. I'm you, glad you you're saying of, that yeah. because the, I don't know. It, it's almost like the star architects are running out of forms at this point to, to make. I mean, you got the circle, you got the wave, you got the, and it's almost, it's almost become this sort of desperate situation where uh, what can I do crazier with this sort of given form? And I don't know if anybody saw this, but in China now they've, uh, they've sent out a law says you can't do a weird building anymore <laughs> in China, which I thought was kind of interesting for a government to say, okay, we've got enough weird buildings now can we do buildings? And I, I'd, I'd have to look more closely at the verbiage, but it's almost like we got to do more buildings that are um, less weird, I guess, but also part of the part of what the 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 uh, people want, rather than the big funny-looking mm. thing. Well, it also seems there's some problem with the term architect. I mean, I think oh, yeah. architects are kind of, you know, um, criticized for doing what they've done. And therefore, therefore, I think the term maker architect is a more comfortable term that people seem happier with. I mean, I mean, I don't know, Anthony. Maybe you, you kind of find that. I mean, you probably don't frame yourself as a maker architect when you meet. I mean, we intentionally <laughs> avoid hats because, <laughs> yeah. um, generally, I agree with the opinion that they generally used to exclude people rather than include people, like wearing professional hats. And I think like the the, the concept of making is really interesting. But like when you meet a maker, then the people describe as makers are almost always awful human beings who are really boring. Who talk to you about three D printing for four hours <laughs> and how they're going to how they're going to revolutionize the world because of you know this new technology. They're, they're the only people somehow discovered the, the true potential. And like it's like it's a type like you can hide behind titles. It's almost a way of giving yourself an importance that you don't necessarily. I, I, I don't. I find like I actively try and avoid. And like it's just like because actually like the most important thing of a lot of things. I think you know whoever the kind of conversation's with, it's just being in that conversation, and I have to be in that conversation. And whether that's like the, the sort of more traditional sort of client relationship, or whether it's like a, a kind of wider kind of conversation that's, some, you know, like a sort of in you know, Liverpool, where the client is a kind of quite amorphous group, or you know, whoever it is, but it's about allowing yourself to be just part of that conversation, and not this kind of person who has a title, who therefore has a kind of credibility because of that title, and actually the credibility comes from a kind of trust, a mutual trust with the people you're working with. And that also applies to people who are building the thing and the people who are. Mm. And so I think, I think the, like, the concept of what maker is, where it started, it feels really mean, but really kind of worthwhile. But I guess the title is just one that I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable with. Mm. Mm. I mean, uh, does it mean though when you do work with somebody that, that you, you hand over a certain power to them, they become co-architects? Or do you see them as co-architects? I think co-authors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah that's... It's, well, maybe, yeah, because it's a really interesting, and I totally agree. I think <laughs> labels are dangerous as hell because um, some of the best architecture out, whatever that means, is, was done by non-architects. Um, <coughs> and what, but I'm, you know, I was trained, I'm licensed, I'm official, you know, as, a, as an architect. And I think it is a dangerous word, but it does mean that, um, and it should mean in the abstract that I'm sort of trained in a way of thinking. Just like when I engage 
some of the most inspirational moments for me are working with craftspeople. N m what's not particularly inspirational for me, and I don't want to offend anybody out there, is talking to architects. Because I'm actually, I find it actually kind of uninteresting. And I, I learn more from uh, people working on in body shops or people uh, making uh, a, a piece of art or people that are involved in some sort of social agenda. And that's what gets me going because um, if I can learn from those people, because in a way they have their specialty, they have their sort of interests, um, I just find it completely interesting to engage that kind of personality. And hopefully the reverse is true. You know, I can bring something to the table because I think about architecture in a certain way. And, and Anthony, you know, I saw in the work, I saw a clear headed mm. thinking about architecture, you know. And I don't know if that would have come from the client. There was a way of thinking about the buildings that Assemble is smart about. And I think that comes with uh, training. It comes with just sensitivity. It comes with uh, just being smart about mm. the built environment. So yeah, you agree. I think, so I think it's important that it's like, it's not that, yeah, it's not that, the, that, the per that you have no value and no speciality. It's just about of understanding how that fit, yeah, how that fits with the broader purpose. Not that mm. you have no particular skill, no particular mm. attitude, just that, mm. that I guess it's the moving away from that, I guess that that kind of total character and something that the skills are complementary and they, yeah, you're doing something that someone else can't, but equally, you know, the, the guy who's the amazing lead worker on the roof mm. is doing something that you could never do. And that's right. really, it's complementary rather than um, dictatorial. Yeah, so I'm gonna open it up to the audience in a bit, but also I'd like, before I do that, so everyone can have time to think of a question or two, but also, um, are you seeing? Em are you able to define these em these emerging alternative forms of practice? I mean, are you able to kind of frame them? I mean, I mean, I'm thinking <laughs> of the RBA plan of work here. Does it? Does it? Does it? Does, are you seeing new? You know, it clearly doesn't fit the way you work, uh, um, or or maybe uh, we're I not. I don't know. I guess I, I guess we never. I, our way of working is just like deeply, deeply personal, mm. and it's evolved out of like a ma like a really long discussion. I I, I wouldn't a minute think anyone should kind of copy us and do what we're doing and like it evolved out of like a really long conversation and in some ways it's deeply inefficient and flawed in other ways it's fit but it fits us as a group um i don't know like so i think it's hard to kind of characterize in that way yeah but i think what's happening is i and i don't even think we have the choice if this makes sense to people i think it i think um in fact we have a term in our office that um for hiring people say so hire the best athlete because we don't know how that person is gonna, what position that person is gonna play in the firm or what they wanna play. And so what we try to do, and I think this is true, you have groups like Assemble come along and, and they're, that's terrific because they're cultural, I don't overstate this, troublemakers in a way. They're sort of <laughs> questioning, <laughs> questioning a situation or theaster gates in, in the United States. And they're outliers, they're misfits. It's like our office is made up, I think, of a lot of misfits and weirdos. And I actually think that's kind <laughs> of, it's kind of interesting and it's, and it's good. I don't know if you want to map a, a direction on, on misfits and weirdos, but I think they're absolutely important to sort of reconsider what I think we've been saying is a, is a part of our profession that just is sort of withering and becoming irrelevant. Um, and we've got bigger issues mm -hmm. to deal with in, in the future. I think that I like I like I wear the you like mis misfit. With you pride. like the. <laughs> yeah. I think this idea like this weirdness in probably means that you're really into uh, yeah. like you're s you're really into what you're doing and like being really. Yeah. I think we like in some ways like re embrace the nerd. Like you know you really kind of love what you're doing and it's like amazing. That's quite that's quite somebody can talk to you for yeah. like you in the in a really fascinating way. Can talk to you exactly. about the thing they do yeah, yeah. with a real passion a real belief. It's kind of. And I guess that's why it feels so exciting working yeah, with interesting in a, people. But in a way, society is full of misfits and weirdos now. I mean, the rise <laughs> of individualization. Um, it's, it's, it, that they're celebrated, you know, and they're seen as interesting, aren't they? So one way or form, I think you're absolutely right. The, the maker architect is is comfortably a misfit and a weirdo. Mm -hmm. um, would anyone like to agree or disagree with that, and ask a question yeah, <laughs> in terms of contributing to the debate about the r the rise of the maker architect? I just wondered. This is a question for Anthony. I wondered whether um, how you feel about actually winning the Turner Prize, and whether you feel like, well, firstly, whether it it crossed, wh wh whether, whether you considered uh, not accepting it, and secondly, whether you think that in some sense it compromises your um, your perhaps ambition for what the architect might become, or, or, or that you want it to be in terms of your working practice. 
you say you don't like hats and, and sort of um, being perceived as knowing things. And I wonder whether the Turner Prize comes with a certain sense or a certain element of baggage that perhaps you don't want or don't need. Um, so yeah, we did talk about it. I think the, the moment when we were really happy to accept, so the nomination comes, I don't know, most, I think a lot of people don't think you kind of put yourself forward for it, you're nominated out kind of out of the blue. So you're kind of plucked from obscurity. I know like some of the other artists have found that quite kind of uh, tricky because they, you know, the work they did is not necessarily made for that kind of forum. It's made like for a quite a different show and suddenly it's given this kind of stage. And I guess what kind of convinced us that it felt like it was okay is how enthusiastic the people in in Liverpool were about it, the CLT were about it, really were, and so the, we kind of, the almost the first thing we do is we, asked, we talked to them about it and told them about it, and then we sat down and had a long chat, and, and I guess we were, I, what we were really cautious about, and I, I'm still kind of slightly troubled by it, is the idea that um, by kind of, is that, that we become championed that somehow is the saviour of this area, which is like really problematic, and that equally that by defining it as art, it gets taken out of the realm of like a real sort of social action, and, and become this kind of weird justification of things like, you know, a whole bunch of really socially aggressive policies. Like, th this project is a re reaction to. Like, you know, if this, is a, this project emerged out of desperation, it's probably not the way things should be done in a way, in some ways. Mm. Like, it's a result of the government withdrawing any kind of real support for sort of social welfare. Mm. And I think by taking it in the art world, you make it like, look, this is an amazing thing, we don't actually have to go to any social housing anymore. Yeah, yeah. Art can do it instead. And that, like, is deeply troubling. But, so I guess I'm conflicted, but I think, I guess, I don't know. I think it's also too hard to tell. Maybe maybe we'll fuck us over completely, and, and in a year's time we'll have to call it a day, and and, <laughs> and, and, and like <laughs> and that's it. But I go. It felt like on balance the risk was worth it, and I don't know. It's hard. To, I guess like, what do you think? Has it compromised us? Well, yeah, right. Well, it's hard to tell. I think, but yeah, I think it's sort of an interesting question to ask whether it sort of um, nullifies your ability to be the architects that you that you want to be. Yeah. I think it, there's a, like an intrinsic risk it could, yeah. But it is potentially an, an alternative form of practice, isn't it? By, by taking that, laying claim to that territory. Yeah, I, I d yeah, I don't know. I'm, I feel I'm, I'm sorry, I think I'm potentially more conflicted than lots of other people assemble about what it means. So, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of quite, I don't know, quite cautious about it. But I think it's a risk that you know we kind of believe our own hype and it mm. just become awful. But you know. <laughs> Do you, yeah. do you tend to work like an architect, an artist studio then, or, or I mean, you know, you, you, you spoke a little bit about the kind of um, the way assemble practice and the way they work. Um, is it less like an office or more, um, less like, more like, less like a traditional office and more like a, I, a, a collaborative art? I don't know. I mean, I think, I guess what's a traditional, pra I guess what's a traditional practice, like you mm. describe a practice yeah. that feels like quite, quite it's shared and... I d yeah, I don't know. I think I think there's many different models of practice, and like one is like the desk-based one, and we've got another one. I don't know if it's more like art or less like art. I don't really know what art is. I think. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a it's a great question. Of course, we get that asked all the time, and um, and I'm not even sure. Um, I know how we sort of answer that question internally is that there are leads on the project. At some point, the the project lead makes the final decision to present to the client. Client ult ultimately, in our case has the yay or nay <coughs> because we engage in a, a dialogue if they like it or don't like it. And if they don't like it, either we failed solving uh, 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 a issue for them or a problem or an idea or that we didn't articulate it clearly enough. Um, but that's shame on us. We come back with another idea. But it's a little different where this, there's a collaborative sort of effort by everybody Hopefully, good ideas make it, and if the lead on the project is smart about it, they're going to they're gonna take that idea, and everybody becomes a co-author in a way. But at one point, there's a, there's a final line that sometimes has to be made in a democratic situation, and that's the lead on the project. Now, that may not be the way Assemble works. Uh, there may be sort of a, a cooperative collaboration, collaborative decision at the end and then it's almost mm. voted on democratically and I don't know. Um, it rarely comes to it, but if it does come to it, yeah, it's a vote in the end. Yeah. Like, fun, it, fun, like actually, but it's really odd, like generally we just argue incessantly about it. And so it's a deeply, like, in some ways, it's a deeply, um, some ways, inefficient process, but I think it's one that feels, it's also like, it's also kind of about defending yourself. It's like, it's both a, like a nice way. It's like also sharing. I think it's like, it's not just about 
I think it's like the you know it's the other side of it. It's also it's like it's really supportive because you feel like we are doing something. You've got a group of people who are behind you. So when when you're at that meeting and you're presenting it, you feel that actually this idea has gone through mm. 50, 14 other, fifteen other people who are kind of on the whole behind it. Mm -hmm. And so it actually gives you a huge amount of confidence. As it you know, it both gives you confidence yeah. as an individual, but that you, there's a collective. But do you have world. a sense of do you, do you actually discuss the nature of craft? Um, I don't think we discussed that much. I don't know. It's like it, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, do you discuss making? You must discuss um, how I guess it's not, made. Not, I don't you know? really talk about big ideas in abstract that much. We talk about, I mean, like I said, we're, we're kind of a weird group in a way because we we know we spent a lot of time with each other, and so we know each other kind of potentially almost too well. And so, like, it's a really strange personal way of working that probably doesn't. And I think one of the questions is like, if we grow, how we grow, and how we take people on, and how all those things work, because actually we don't really know any of those answers yet. So far, we've only been these kind of people mm. that. But and occasionally people come into it, and it's, a, it's sort of at some point it's a bit of like a weird cult in a way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like it's, I think it's just like we talk all the time, and, and sometimes a lot of it's completely irrelevant, and a lot of it. And and I, guess, it's about I guess another question, another way of framing that is: architects have desks, but makers have benches, workbenches. So do you describe your desks or workbenches? I think the desks. Okay, <laughs> 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 that answers my question then. Yeah. Is there anyone else going to ask me yeah. a question Dan. about? Um, what do you think a good outcome is for your project? Because it seems to me that um, that might s also help to sort of clarify the different type of making that you're trying to do. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of traditions that exist here. It's not like a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking of Walter Siegel and the self-build movement and this sort of community architecture of the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. as one sort of thing. And I was thinking from you know, your side, it was more like the Frank Lloyd Wright, sort of really understanding the materials and the making and the tool making. Yeah, and then Charles Moore, of course, his whole democratic approach to um, designing and then uh, not openly making, mm -hmm. I don't think, but, but designing yeah. as, as a, and his system. So and, it, it, the, the sort yeah. of question is, what's the, what, what, what do you what think is the outcome? outcome? That's a good question. I mean, it's, uh, is it, is it, are you, are you, either of you aiming at a kind of system that you can transfer knowledge to the community, or are you aiming at a kind of, you know, an iconic piece of architecture? And I think it's quite interesting that you mentioned Walter Siegel, because I know Assemble have been working on a, on a reinvention of a Walter Siegel project. So in a way you've had to, have you reinvented Walter Siegel? Uh, <laughs> or have you kind of just honored that system, but repackaged it so it can be transferred? And um, I, I yeah, I don't know about that one. Um, <laughs> I haven't worked that much on that project, to be honest. Um, I don't think we're trying to develop. I mean, I completely agree. Yeah, we're not doing something new, and I think I'm kind of really uncomfortable with the way that like, it's, a, it's a press thing, like you said. Do they? I'm kind of used to the same thing with like photos and becomes like the final thing, and like press love a story that's a, about like, yeah, you're, they're doing something brand new, and, and I don't think we yeah. feel that we're doing something brand new. I think we feel we're, we're kind of we're, we're you know learning from a whole bunch of different things, and we've again we've found a way of working that kind of works for us and. Um, but it is what you would call an alternative way of practicing it. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's it's our <laughs> alternative. It's like mm. it's a very personal thing, and I don't. Th I think the the only thing I'd say you can learn from it is how you. It's a. It's how you learn about being really kind of careful about how you do things and how you learn from things. I don't know. I think it's a it's a tricky one. But mm. It's a really tricky one, and <laughs> and the only way. And and I don't know if I'm avoiding answering your question because it's a it's a great question. I really don't think you know if, an arch if a piece of architecture is good for at least five years or ten years. And w after that sort of time has elapsed, and does the b is the building beloved? Because you can really see that some of these buildings are beloved by the community, and some are just reviled by a community. Because um, is that building go is it is that building appropriately whatever mm -hmm. that means responding to the situation? Is it actually well, I guess is it actually noting? Yeah. Um, something about the culture, about how people use that building. And you will get, um, yeah. I still get um, phone calls or emails from people that experience a building that's 10, 12, uh, yeah, mm. uh, 16 years old. And uh, because the, the whole newness situation with, with uh, a straight out of the box architecture, I think it's I think it's dangerous, and I'm on juries all the time, you know, where I'm supposed to make a decision whether a piece of architecture is is great architecture, and and I actually am kind of <coughs> conflicted about that because I'd rather 
wait five years to 10 years and then come in and say, mm -hmm. really, is this building just a, a blob on the, on the ground mm -hmm. that looked cool 12 years ago, or is it really something mm -hmm. that I think that's well. a really good answer. I mean, I think our, how quickly should buildings be assimilated and, as, and um, almost assumed by the community? And I think sometimes there's a lot of criticism given to architects because they force buildings on, mm -hmm. on people. And I think that's where there's the negative kind of values that <coughs> come out of that. But clearly, that the success of a great piece of architecture is that it's celebrated and it's loved. And I think, and I think maybe the traditional architect, maybe the alternative way of practicing, you have more of a sense that the building will be loved. I, don't know, I think it's like, I thought it was about like giving up ownership of it, and then mm -hmm. there's an amazing video um, about Pesac, the sort of Cabuzia housing, that's showing like sort of 30 years after. I can't remember who it's by now, but it's sort of all the kind of strange like chintz essentially that people have put into it to make it their home. And I think you know it's something that probably I don't know. It's hard to know what Cabuzia would have thought about it, but I think what's really amazing about that would you have chucked out the chintz? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe I think <laughs> it's what's I think it's really amazing about I it. Hope it shows so. how like <laughs> even these kind he of likes like it. Hope these. He likes um, it. Think how people make a home their home, and how actually it's not up to you as an architect to dictate what happens. Totally after, you know, you do the th you're creating the scene and you're doing stuff, but, but it's it's what you know what kind of and the success or failures is super. Well, in a way, what you're what you're doing, Anthony, is you're getting more into the detail of the home, aren't you? I mean, especially on the um, Granbury Terrace, you're looking yeah. at you're looking at the detail of how people live and. <coughs> but I guess also it's about like trying to make places that people can come in and, and make their mark. I, I totally agree. In fact, I, I think it's one of the most interesting things that you can experience is going back to a building that you worked on uh, after 10 years and see how the owners or the, or the clients have engaged it and changed it. So if there's chintz hanging around or a bunch of bad furniture, it's actually totally fascinating you know, <laughs> to, to see and something kind of more interesting than, you know, a couple of beautifully placed Bellini chairs and a, you know, a and the Gucci table, and then you know, photograph, which has its own charm. But but really, after as a yeah. building grows, we, and then the messes we make, these messes are around for 100 years, 150 years. So we don't even know generationally how our future generations are going to be using this building. And I think um, uh, a great um, sort of idea, Stuart Brand, in, in his book, How Buildings Learn, which is you know pretty interesting in some ways. He has a pretty interesting quote where he says the only thing you know ab uh, the only thing you know about a building is you will you know, the only thing you can predict uh, about a building is how it will be used in the future and I think that's true uh, we work in a warehouse that was a shoe manufacturing and a shirt manufacturing <coughs> building the people that designed that certainly had no idea that you know a bunch of um, web based companies and law firms and um, uh, architecture firms would show up in this. And it was a flop house before it was uh, uh, basically an office building. And um, it just means that this building is, and it's a beloved kind of building. It's part of the fabric. And it just can kind of morph with the different um, culture. And that way a culture can kind of engage it. There was another a couple of questions at the top there first. Just building on that, is that looking at all the images coming up, all your, a lot of your architecture is made up of moving parts and adaptability. Is that kind of a response to, there isn't one answer to how the architecture should be, it should be adaptable or... It like should be transformative. Yeah. yeah, to the client. You know, they don't want one, just one form, they need... Well, hopefully that, that is true. Um, I'm always a little nervous about the movable stiff stuff because it, because it can be kind of... Uh, potentially kind of gimmicky and kind of uh, and I'm nervous about that but it really is intended that the to your point which I'm glad you noted it really is intended that's like the clothing on your body when it's hot outside you, you know you can move these things uh, open and when it's cold outside you can kind of put clothing on so you can kind of change the building um, and change the environment of the building whether you want to feel kind of enclosed and intimate or you want to feel more open and, and prospect like in the place but that's absolutely right. I personally, I find it kind of s stunningly boring uh, to go into a house and everything is in mm. perfect location. And it's like mm. that's where the hanky goes, and that's what. I guess that, that sense of adaptability does allow people to engage with it and personalize it. Well, I think it. that's assembled. Yeah. Do, do, do you find that it's it adaptable? Well, 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 Your well, projects are adaptable like as well. Yeah, I guess what you're kind of hearing, like adaptability doesn't mean it has to move physically. Like, exactly. like while like those the, your things are really performative and they're kind of enjo really enjoyable, they're like that. I think it's a thing that often seems to happen in architecture school, especially that students think that adaptable means that everything, all the walls have to move. 
And actually, like we're talking about, is like your yeah. office and like our office and things like that. And these like warehouses, they're adaptable partly because they've got like a, exactly. a, a laxness of space and a robustness built into them. And, and like adaptability can occur across a lots of a lots of ways. I think it, it you know it can mean things like sort of movable things and things that change. But it can also just be like the generosity of space and the way the kind of robustness of the way of construction. And that uh, you know I think projects we've worked like something like Yard House is about mm -hmm. just giving someone the height to work with and that means that it's a kind of more robust <coughs> form that mm -hmm. can take many different uses and then allow someone, you know, and like obviously it's a cost thing as well, like, you know, it's cheaper to build that mm -hmm. way but then it also offers like a potential for future. Well, I think design, to kind of think like that also involves a different way of designing, doesn't it? Because, you know, an architect would traditionally work to a brief that a client has given them but in that case, both of you, you're thinking of actually adding to the brief. You're thinking of actually taking something you're thinking of leading the brief rather than rather than the client leading the brief because mm. you're 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 thinking ahead of that. You're preempting. You're preempting the brief. I think it's yeah. questioning the brief. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or rehearsing, you know, and just imagining what might happen, but not trying to answer the questions that I, I, I don't even know the questions that would be asked in the future. <laughs> is is there enough sort of yeah. um, flexibility in the situation to allow this thing to sort of morph and change and grow yeah. with whatever? <coughs> Tom, uh, how to phrase this in a way that isn't rude. Um, like, I've been on your website, I know your work, I know your firm's work, and basically I like half of it, which is the <laughs> half that you seem to have been involved with, and I don't like the other half of it, which is the half that Jim's been involved with. Uh -huh. And so I would be really interested in you articulating maybe how the two of you approach design differently, and what yeah. it means when you're the design principal versus Jim, yeah. And, and sort of what's going on that is leading me to have this sort of taste reaction of I like this stuff and I don't like this other stuff. Uh, just to be clear, when Jim's lecturing, he gets the same question. Well, I, <laughs> I like your stuff. Uh, who's this other guy doing this sort of rusty stuff? Um, no, you know, you know, that's actually a really good question. And I'm, I'm glad you asked. And it has to do more with personality than taste because I, I don't, I'm not particularly interested in, in um, uh, a particular sort of uh, aesthetic direction. <coughs> I'm more interested in the person that's, you know, how they're directed. And, and I remember when I came down from Alaska, I was looking to work with a firm, and, and uh, um, I knew that the, the Jim Olson's firm at that point, you know, had, had done some pretty interesting stuff. And uh, I didn't necessarily um, have sympathies to, to Jim's work, but I really had sympathy with his tenacity and his toughness to follow through on what he believed was right. Because I, you know, I, I worked, um, I almost gave up the business, basically, because uh, I was in the postmodern decade, and God, I just thought that was a hideous decade <laughs> of, of, and you know, I didn't get the joke, you know, I didn't get the wit, I mean, I was like, God, it's just <laughs> like, what's this all about, and I almost quit. And, uh, Jim, during that entire time, he just kept relentlessly sort of following what he believed was right, whatever was right, and I just said, well, that's the guy I want to work for and with because that's the kind of misfit, the kind of person that is uh, uh, a dreamer, is optimistic about making the world a better place, and um, so I've just, I, I think we share that because I don't think Jim would necessarily think that what I do is you know, is really in his sort of value system either, but I hope he feels the same way about me. And, and I'm just a, you know, I'm just a part of it. There's a whole bunch of other people in the firm that are kind mm -hmm. of emerging and doing their, and they have their own uh, personality. In fact, this is actually really important, is what I say to students when I teach, don't do what I do. Because if you're looking at stuff up here, that's already seven years old. I'm in, a, I'm in a different place. It was built, it was published or photographed. It's already old. I'm in a different place. The only way you can keep current is keep current to yourself and make decisions you know, based on a series of values and a series of principles. Does that kind of make sense and kind of answer your question? It's a, good, it's a great question. Yep, Jane? Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of quite aware that when we talk about like alternative practice and the make architect, Often these conversations are held within kind of universities and architecture schools, mm -hmm. and so you're kind of talking to a lot of people who are kind of like super like hopeful that they'll go into industry and be able to like radically challenge it or engage with people who are are doing that. Um, and so I was kind of wondering whether kind of actually would you give this same um, 
lecture to your client mm -hmm. and what role does and responsibility does the client have in kind of valuing and recognizing these practices because we we all like love this idea that architects can do all these other things and we're all really up for it and there's absolutely no challenge to that but then you've got the client and I so I particularly of you Tom I was wondering how you engage your client well uh, so that's a great question also because believe me it's not an easy path what you guys are embarking on and uh, but you keep your you keep your eyeball on the on the center line and things begin to sort of emerge and you sort of make decisions based on on where you're going and hopefully you don't waver from what's important to you and um, it's uh, you know what I always say is uh, to students this stuff did not happen overnight um, get th these clients coming to us now whether it's Jim's work or, or, or the work that maybe I was involved in these are clients that you can almost immediately read it in their eyes. They understand, they get it, and they're in for it. You know, they're willing to take a risk because there's some pretty risky things that we sometimes do. With some of these big things that moved, move. Um, they're a very special group of people. Um, I mean, I always say this to architects. I mean, your clients are <laughs> most they obviously they hire you. Um, they're pretty important to to a future. They're also extraordinary people because can you imagine? And put yourself in their place. You're laying out hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars on some of these projects. You have no idea what you're getting. You're like commissioning a piece of art. So if you are already, by demonstrating that, you're already a risk taker. You're already somebody that's willing to not buy the commodity out there, the usual, usual stuff that you can buy off a, a shopping shelf. You're already extraordinary. So see your client that <laughs> way. See that your client actually is probably a misfit also because they're hiring you like that. They'll, they're, they're willing um, and interested in your dialogue and what you're thinking about. Mm. And I, it won't be easy. It won't mm. be, you know, there's so many. I, I don't want to bum you out, but I just want to <laughs> tell you there's a, there's a realistic sort of pathway yeah. um, that you just have to be, you have to be tougher now. I learned that with, with John Ross Kelly and Chris mm. Kopsinski. Mountain climbing at their level tougher than hell mm. with unbelievable risk and when you went with them you just knew that these were relentless mm. um, people that that knew how to tough it out through tough things and I just you know I, I brought a little bit of that along yeah. I think that's a really good good point you raised there Tom I mean almost like maker architects need maker clients yeah I mean you know, and, and actually it does when both of your presentations you do kind of have that you know mm -hmm. your, your clients will find you and you find the clients that suit where you want to work yeah I think there is a fundamental problem with all this, though, that we're talking to the wrong people. It's like we're in a room of <laughs> yeah. like exactly. middle class, yeah. mainly middle, like mainly white, yeah. mainly liberal, yep. Yep. Um, mainly men. It seems I don't know if that's entirely no, true. But um, maybe that's not quite right. But <laughs> then you know, the fact that like you know, even as you go through the profession, the, the number of women drops massively. The number of kind of more socially excluded drops massively. And like there is like a fundamental problem with all these talks. You're talking to the people who kind of already think the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I maybe. I don't know, maybe that's not in that great and that, you know. Well, how do you great. change that? I don't know. I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of do want to depress mean, you. The world's We should really put shit. you on the road. <laughs> like, <laughs> and like, we're in a situation where our current government yeah. is trying to destroy most kind of hard fought, yeah. like, liberal values. And I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. but it's kind of, I get, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I guess what the, 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 the bit that's not depressing is that there still seem to be enough gaps. Yeah. You can, do something that you feel is rewarding and like that feels like the only strength you can have is yeah. find those little kind of cracks in the margins and but like I think it is worth I don't know it feels like, like well, a lot of the system is massively skewed against like nice things happening here's the bizarre <laughs> thing is back to winning the Turner Prize you know okay you could argue that maybe that is almost something that kills you know the dream in a way I don't I don't know but what it does is it gives these guys a lever for the next sort of um, thing that they might do, the next success, you know? And if, if they're smart, they're gonna take that little blessing by an institution and they may be able to have more effect just mm -hmm. culturally. And it's, again, it's all incremental, it's all granular. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. And then all of a sudden, I think after 20 years, things begin to happen. Mm -hmm. I can look at my career, Things didn't really click for me until I was 36, 37 years old. Mm. Mm. Probably scares half the people in this, this <laughs> audience. <laughs> but it's, it's really, you know, that's when you really know what you're doing and you got it kind <coughs> of figured out in a way that, a language that makes sense mm. to you. But it's, a, it's worth it. 
I mean, you can take the easy road, fine. You know, you'll do fine. But if you take the tough road, good things happen, I think. That's a good point. I think I'm just following on from these conversations. And, and first of all, thank you very much for both of the presentations. Um, and it's a question about space for nice things versus spaces in the field where we know there are real problems. Yeah? And this is the kind of specter of this conversation which keeps coming back about the problems to do with architecture. And I was wondering if you could both talk to the challenges and potentials that you come across shifting scale. Yeah? And that's like the relationship between this also incredibly beautiful, um, quite remote uh, residential projects, for example, in, in your work, Tom, and then some of the urban projects. Yeah? Knowing that really the issues with the pr profession in some sense are about how we end up dealing with cities and, and, and get cities to function. So maybe if you could somehow both speak to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess a good I, I can really like actually a lot of the problems are to do with economics and they do with, and I think what, I don't I, this is more personal rather than like necessarily my assemble hat, but I think some people feel the same. It's like for, for us to have any hope of changing kind of the broader issues, you have to, you have to be like, engage with those kind of forces and like it, the idea that that um, you can opt out of being involved with the politics and being involved with economics and, and kind of awareness of those things um, and I yeah I agree you're probably not going to change them particularly quickly and you might not and never change them but um, the other alternative is giving up entirely it seems <laughs> and it feels like w there is still enough room in margins and gaps and there's enough people who are willing to give like a take at risk and I'm aware of the fact that we're insanely lucky to be in the position we're in at the moment and like had a kind of series of, of quite kind of serendipitous moments. But it's, I guess it's also it's like the thing we did do is have the kind of the bravery at the time to kind of take those moments. But yeah, I agree. I think like, you know, in the end you're, there's a huge system and, and like in some ways the, the problems are much more systemic. I think there's a, you know, it's a kind of problem of talking to a room mainly of architects that actually like that is that. I remember we did a talk a while ago with Richard Wentworth things like, yeah, the wrong people in the room. What you need to be talking to is the, you want the politicians over there and you want mm -hmm. developers and then actually like, that's where kind of real systemic change happens, and and we're kind of like flirting away at nothing here, talking about like nice objects. But the point is, I guess but you I still <laughs> no, it's, it's mm. both. Like it, you can mm -hmm. have a social intent with a very small object, it's yep. but you can't lose sight of that like broader political question that you're in a deep like a deep. We're currently, especially like mm. London, like a deeply conflicted, deeply troubled city, and those yeah. issues aren't going to be solved mm. by like making in a way. Yeah, but <laughs> but they also were very powerful notions. I mean, in in, in the Liverpool project where you. You're working on a fireplace, and that's transformative, isn't it? Yeah, and that's so, part. So of you're right. That so, but equally, like somewhere in Liverpool is like, it's 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 a real problem that the way social housing is delivered is through an art grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's I think we get that yeah. part of it, right? But the question is about like how we scale up those moments. You said you know this, it's always incremental, and as I'm just wondering about what those steps are yeah. for you. And I mean, I buildings I are just I'm objects in space. So how do we deal with the city? Yeah, and I'm not answering your question, but but there's sort of a part, <laughs> but a part of your question, which I think is actually interesting. The the artist I, that I grew up with, and I, I did a lot of his art for. He was he was a socialist, you know, died in a world socialist. So I'd hear the rants about the rich and the whole thing. And and then at one point, he, I was working on a sculpture. I was about 16 or 17 years old. And he go, goes, God, you know, Tommy, maybe the rich aren't so bad. They're the only people that buy my art. <laughs> <laughs> and there is. And we got to always remind ourselves, you know, on, on these agendas that, that you might have, you got to sort of put it in like mm -hmm. global perspective. Um, I was at a, I was at a, uh, uh, what do they call this event? It was at Lake, or no, it was at, uh, in Ta uh, Tahoe. And it was all these kids from Twitter and Facebook and uh, Google. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they're all there with the Rastafarian, you know, hair <coughs> and the hats and the whole thing. And, and actually, Cameron Sinclair, I don't know if you guys remember Cameron Sinclair, the head of architecture for humanity for, for years. He and I were the oldest people there. And we were listening to this rant about the 1%, the, uh, you know, uh, in America, you know, that we got we to gotta take down the 1%, the, the you know, to help the 99%. And I'm going... Uh, these people are the point zero 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 one percent of the world. I mean, it, it was like they, they had this notion that there was this big socialist mm. agenda by them, and, and yet it was this unbelievably wealthy group of, of people. And it was like, and Cameron said, you know what's interesting? He says, if you look at Western Europe and you look at North America, basically, if you want to get down to brass tacks, 
we're the top 5% average relative to the rest of the world in, in, in uh, poverty. And, and so if you want to talk about social agendas that are really big, mm -hmm. those are so big and so overwhelming that it, I think the best thing you can possibly do is imagine it in incremental ways and imagine that all we can do is make our world better um, mm -hmm. in incremental ways that really do have, and again, I think Assemble is, is doing this, this kind of work, and hopefully we are too, that it has an effect, that mm -hmm. over time you begin to affect uh, a culture rather than an object, that you're not building this trophy in the middle of this place, but you actually, through the effect of having a good building or a good project or a good situation, that it begins to sort of tell the story that no, we can actually do this better can do it better collectively. And the forces against it are actually pretty mighty. They're pretty big. Mm -hmm. I come up with a, an, an, a quick question as well. Is, could you talk a bit about the way um, this incredible relationship to landscape plays out in the urban work and does it? Oh gosh, absolutely. I mean, there's no difference. I don't think there's any difference between an urban landscape and a, and a rural landscape. It's all about context. It's all about going in there, understanding what the public, private, you know, situation, the humanity of the place, you know, how you, how you um, react to it. I don't think there's any, any difference. Mm. I Just like kind of the first question, I think, like. About networks. Uh, well about networks and about like, um, yeah. like what you can do in the bigger, I think in the end, uh, and this is gonna sound horrifically lovey, <laughs> sorry, but it's like you can only be happy with what your action has been within, the, you know, you can be confident that you believe and you stand behind what you're doing. And if, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not like, we've been doing this five years, we don't know if anything we've done is that, you know, in the terms of saying, like none of these projects have yet been tested to the point where they can say they're successful or not in a way. Mm -hmm. And as long all you can really be is satisfied that you feel <coughs> that you're doing the right step. And being I think being aware of those bigger systems is already a, enough to help inform your decisions. And mm -hmm. like whether I don't you know, I just don't feel like I'm and many other people in a position to like condemn or support various things. But, like, you can be personally happy that you feel that you're doing the making the right decisions about your work. And I felt if more people really felt that, then it probably would improve things better. And I feel like a lot of people yep. are deeply cynical in what they do, and that's my personal kind of spin on it. But actually, like, all you can do is be satisfied that I think, I can stand up and honestly think that I think I'm doing a better thing than I that, than mm. there previously. But and do you think you do that be by being more collaborative and forming a bigger network? I don't think there's like a fundamental way of doing it. I think like we have found a way of doing that suits us, that mm -hmm. is about yeah. being more collaborative. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that there's not a way of doing yeah. it that's completely different, that's yeah. also p for that person and <coughs> deeply socially valuable and, and is in that maybe it's entirely top down. I think like, I just don't, th again, we've been doing this five years, I just don't think we're in a position to be able to say like, this is the right way and that's the wrong way. We've found a right way that seems to work, or currently seems mm. to work for us. And, and, and that feels nice and I quite like working this way and it's yeah. also deeply, sa like personally satisfying. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way yeah. I work and like, but that's I wonder a lovely whether, thing. I wonder whether the way you <laughs> I wonder whether the way you work moves from the idea of a maker architect to a maker movement. I don't. I don't want to be part of a movement. I right. just, I just, I, I, it's <laughs> not about good. being part of a movement. Like this yeah. isn't something. It's not like yeah. a toolkit you can copy to things. Yeah. Like you have to be satisfied that what you're doing is the right is is on your terms the right thing. And as soon as you start like copying and pasting stuff from other people, you're just gonna fuck it up because you don't yeah. know actually what you're doing. You don't have. You know, it's yep. It's about Agreed. like you're happy that you're doing it. I don't know. Preach over. Um, <laughs> No, good. Any more questions? Yep. Oh, well, it's a bit of an observation, so sorry to be that guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think architects, the, the kind of make of architects has come about because we become these specifiers of products. And like from my own experience and my own practice, we're designing things from like cutlery to Chelsea townhouses. And yeah. I think it's, it's quite interesting when an architect takes an approach of designing products and items, which then, a, it's quite profitable because you can recycle them in their projects. So we've designed our own kitchen range, taps, you know, like loads of kind of stuff, jewellery, which is quite <coughs> bad and unsuccessful. But it's, I think it's just to be aware that you can like make your own products and then sell your own kind of wares because we're all designers at the end of the day. So we can design really beautiful things. What, I guess the question, not for you personally, but generally, honest, what defines an architect as opposed to a designer, as opposed to an artist, as opposed to like are these other kind of terms that, like what, like fundamentally, like what does the title mean that can't be, you know, that that, that means it's this sort of special thing that, you know, I kind of I agree. But with it is up for it is up, it is up for like reinvention, isn't it? That's what we're saying. Yeah, but also like w like what like what are you trying to say with calling yourself an architect? Like, and it means different times, but I think it's like 
what you know in those terms, are you acting as a designer or are you, acting as a, are you an mm -hmm. architect designing products? Are you a product designer? In those both, because the client comes to you as an architect, yeah. but then you can actually offer yeah. other design services and what they yeah. almost don't know about. And I think when you mentioned about plan of works, something what's really missing is like stage minus zero. Yeah, is when clients come to you with briefs, the brief can already be so wrong. You know, like I mean, I could quote Cedric Price on this, and you yeah. probably all know that quote. But I'm not going to, but it's kind of. Yeah, it's just how to help the client. You know, I think that's where the role of the architect needs to come in and the designer. So do you like the term major architect? Uh, I don't, no, not really. I don't really no. use it. But it's how, you get, it's how you're going to get projects in as an architect and then you can actually put your, you know, using the hats, be the designer of other curated things. Well, exactly. It kind of frames the whole other things you do, isn't it? Other than just the architect. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> Contribute? No, well, um, I mean, I've, I've taken a lot from that discussion. Thank you. I mean, uh, maker great. architects, they're, they're weirdos, they're misfits. Yeah. But um, also, well, good. you know, there's, a, and, and there's, there's, there's rewards if you took the tough road. Mm -hmm. But obviously, they're very into adaptable performative. So there is, a, there is some kind of, kind of um, framing of a product that's very different potentially different anyway. Mm. But I think they're much more sensitive, they're much humbler. They're much, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a much more human face for architecture. And, um, and I'd like to thank you, Tom. Thank you. And I'd like to thank, thank you, you Anthony, for thank you. a very interesting